was called HALT Habits. So the acronym it, H is for hunger, A is for anger, mm -hmm. L is for loneliness, and then T is for tiredness. Now, the moment when my athletes started to grab pizza, alcohol, I started to understand that the four triggers were around these four. Right? What do you mean you're, you're hungry? Mm -hmm. Like, it's very hard for me to believe we're, when we're in a country that has full of abundance and full of food. Right. It's very hard for me to believe that you're hungry. Mm -hmm. That was the judgmental part of me, but then asking the, the second layer of question, like, are you hungry? Are you, are you experiencing something that's more internal? The compositions of their meals is what I'm looking at because we can, if we look at the three macronutrients, we've got carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Carbohydrates are the least satisfying out of all three. So the first question is, where was this at? Like what location was it? Yeah. Was it in the couch? Was it in your car? Was it at night? Was it in the morning? And they just write it down. You know, so I think that alone is very powerful. The location can be a trigger for them. The second one is what emotion do I feel before eating that? And what I've noticed over the course of the 10 years of training, that it rarely is hunger. Right, and I love doing this with people because for people who are very confused on why they're not able to see progress with any of their goals with weight loss with anything that they're working through they all of a sudden realize oh it's because i'm drained all the time i wanted to kind of share my eulogy so oh people okay. get an idea Let's do it. going to miss you <sighs> what if the reason you are gaining weight is not because of the food you're consuming but because of something so small, we don't even notice it. In today's episode, I'm here with my wife today, and I wanna talk about the four triggers that can be possibly making you gain weight. So before we start with this particular topic, one, I'd love to know how mindset plays a role in nutritional coaching, especially for weight loss clients. Yeah, it's pretty huge. So if I had to give you a percentage, I would say about 80% of what I'm doing with people is mindset to help them with behavior change. And I wouldn't have thought that when I went to school because when I went to school a long time ago, that was not something that was discussed. So this was something that I learned over time to recognize. And a lot of it I actually learned from you. Mm -hmm. So you were doing a lot of mindset coaching and helping people with behavior change. And I was seeing you have all of these transformations with your clients. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? I'm not having the same results. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of textbook, you know, going through and telling people what to do. And surprise, that doesn't work. So yeah. uh, a lot of what I learned and what I'm still learning is actually from you. So the four triggers that we're talking about today were things that once you told them to me, I thought, duh, <laughs> like, okay, yes, those four things are really important, but I've never put it together before. So maybe you can even talk about how you discovered those because that's a skill that you have that I definitely don't have. You're able to see patterns and things with clients. So maybe you can tell us how you identified that over time mm -hmm. and what the triggers are. I, that's a great question. I think a lot of the frameworks that I've created over the course of like 10 years has been built through frustration. Mm -hmm. And just like you, you started with nutritional coaching, changing weight loss. I was on the trainer side. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just going to do all of the physical things that I know, and I'm going to try to change people's bodies. And for some athletes, that worked really well, and then another 50 to 80% of them, the physical side didn't completely change the whole picture. So I started implementing nutrition, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge awareness at some point that not everyone knew what nutrition was. 
So we taught them the basics, like cut out the sugars, like the sodas, the 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 snacks, the treats. Let's get them to drink water, get them to eat enough protein, so on and so forth. Just the basics. Yeah. And again, another maybe 20, 30 percent of them started to change. Mm -hmm. And then there were a handful of athletes that had the physical, they understood the nutrition, but yet they were either gaining weight or they just kind of stayed the same and hit a plateau. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the drawing board and I'm like, okay, this is a little bit frustrating. What's going on now? And then we started to get into mindset, but more specifically, not just the mind, but the triggers. Mm -hmm. So I started to ask them because eventually I was like, hey, listen, you're doing all the nutrition stuff right. You're definitely doing all the fitness stuff right because I'm here with you and I see you doing your homework. What's going on in the food stuff? Let's just, let's just run that down. Yeah. And what I did was give me your next three meals mm -hmm. for the next three days and then they would give me it. And then this follow-up question was like, is this, is, if th is this, is this what you normally eat in the, in, in the three days that you normally tell me? And they're like, Royce, uh, <laughs> let me be completely honest. No, it's not. Because, yeah. because you've told me to do it, I've kind of ate a little bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. But there were a few other days where I had a pizza, I had a glass of wine, I had a six pack of beer, mm -hmm. you know, I went to uh, McDonald's and I was like, oh, that makes absolute sense yeah. now because now we're, we're, we're tracking this. And one part is they didn't feel comfortable telling me the truth, which yeah. is like partly on my end. So I had to rebuild that trust. And then going into that conversation, I think it's important to be like, dude, that's okay. The more I know, the better. Mm -hmm. So that was like one big piece. But the second piece to this was I started asking, why did you eat the pizza? Yes. And then <laughs> why did you drink that alcohol? Mm -hmm. You know, and it started like that for years and years and years and years and years. And eventually I got to a point where I didn't even recognize it. Mm -hmm. I didn't recognize it at all that I was asking these things and I was solving for some of these triggers. Mm -hmm. And it was just... It was just unconscious. And for a while, I would get frustrated that some of my coaches and trainers didn't understand until you were like, what are you doing so differently that's causing your clients to lose 50, 60, 70 pounds, yet you have another trainer that's only getting them to lose 10 or yeah. maybe none? The workout's the same. The mindset's the same. What's happening? Mm -hmm. So ironically enough, I was listening to a sermon, and the sermon was about habits and they had an amazing acronym for changing bad habits. Mm -hmm. And at this moment of frustration, I'm listening to the sermon. And then the habits were, it was called HALT Habits. So the acronym, it, H is for hunger. A is for anger. Mm -hmm. L is for loneliness. And then T is for tiredness. Now, I've adjusted some of those letters because a majority of my clients typically are not angry. While they, there are some, I replaced it with anxiousness. Yeah. And then on the loneliness side, I also applied depression to it because it's very similar. When you feel lonely, you feel depressed. So, and then tiredness, it's, it's both physical and mental. Mm -hmm. And here's what I started to realize. The moment when my athletes started to grab pizza, alcohol, mm -hmm. shoot, even drugs. Some right. of them reverted to drugs. Yep. I started to understand that the four triggers were around these four. Now mm -hmm. I'm gonna, now the audience is probably like, there are going to be some other triggers, yes. But I'm going to tell you in the past 10 years of my career, it's typically, I want to say even 90% of my clients are, are because of these four triggers. Yeah. Hunger, anxiousness, loneliness slash depression, and then some form of tiredness, which is like physical or mental. Mm -hmm. So once we started to de develop that, I started just, it's just a much easier acronym for me to remember. I didn't have it in a pretty format. So you guys are getting it, this <laughs> framework in a more refined format because my frustrations, I start to create frameworks and you need frameworks to teach a concept that you're decently good at and you need to be able to transfer it to your coach, your trainer, your nutritionist yeah. and, and so on and so forth. Well, and I think it's powerful that you just kept asking why. Yeah. So 
when you just said that, it clicked with me. Oh, that's what I was missing at first. Because mm-hmm. if someone, I've always said I'm a no judgment zone, right? Anybody can tell me they've eaten anything and I'll be okay with it. But I just accepted it. I didn't actually say why. Mm-hmm. So that is the most powerful thing that you can do. And did you find that over time your clients got used to you asking why so that they were just more aware and comfortable like you said, you had to get to that point where you were they were a little bit more comfortable with you. Yeah, it, it took a while because one, I felt like I was invasive mm-hmm. asking them, hey, like, why are you anxious? Mm-hmm. Or what's going on? What do you mean you're lonely? Right. right? What do you mean you're, you're hungry? Mm-hmm. Like, it's very hard for me to believe we're, we're, in, we're in a country that has full of abundance and full of food right. it's very hard for me to believe that you're hungry mm-hmm. right so so that was the judgmental part of me but then asking the the second layer of question like are you hungry are you are you experiencing something that's more internal right and the first step to that is you identifying that mm-hmm. right okay where am i on this ladder and then once you identify it, i think you start to feel okay with it and then the tonality when you're asking your your clients becomes more of like, oh, this is something much greater. It's not yeah. just the nutrition side. Mm-hmm. So recognizing it in yourself as well, you're saying is yeah. what was powerful. Because yeah. yeah, if I'm able to either say to my clients, either I've experienced this before or just to tell them about an experience of another person that I've worked with, mm-hmm. I can see them relax and breathe. Like, I, okay, I'm not alone in this. Yeah. Someone else has felt this before. So I want to get deep really quick because we are currently in really good shape. You're yeah. in decent shape. I'm in decent shape. What are... My son's in decent Lucas shape. Is in decent shape. <laughs> like for me, my triggers are anxiousness and loneliness. Yeah. And I want to go over kind of some of the small tools of how I've have I kind of Lucky, we gotta get you on the <laughs> other side, buddy, okay? <laughs> Our son's here, we're shooting. So but um what are some of your triggers so the audience can at least get like it's okay to have these triggers? Yeah, mine would be anxiousness for okay. sure is a trigger for me because if I am anxious, I am not in a state of mind where I'm going to be planning things. I get mm-hmm. into um, a survival mode and mm-hmm. I forget to do the things that are most important for my health. So probably anxiousness and tired. Tired. And it's more of an emotional tired than anything. Yeah. It's sometimes not physical, it's the emotional. So before I learned how to really make sure that I was filling my cup and having good energy, mm-hmm. just the settings that I was in, even the last place that I worked um, mm-hmm. only a few months ago was very draining. So I'd get home and I'd be tired. Well, when I'm tired, do I feel like cooking a meal for myself and for my family, even if I have all the ingredients? No. So that too would be, those are my big two that I started to notice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes, uh, for me, here's, we were both anxious. Yeah. So you're anxious and then you don't pre-plan and mm-hmm. you end up eating something that's a little bit more convenient or yep. easier to cook yeah. or easier to grab, which is typically not the healthiest option that we, we, we like to choose. And there's nothing wrong with it. But in those events, that's just kind of where you go into. Yeah. Here's what's different about me. When I'm anxious, I don't eat. I know. <laughs> which is so different. But then again, it's also, in, you know, it, but then there's this, that trigger is not good for me too, because I love to yes. train so, so many times that if I'm not eating the right amounts, I start proliferating a lot of these injuries like my elbows hurt my shoulders hurt my knees hurt so oftentimes when I'm injured it's an indication that I'm extremely anxious Mm -hmm. and it's not because I'm training but it's because I'm anxious and when I start to create tools around reducing my anxiety Mm -hmm. prioritizing what's important I, 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 I end up feeling hungry again yeah so in moments where I'm stable my hunger like I'm normal I tend to eat two to three times out of the day. But if I'm doing that, then it's very, very interesting. But things that I do overeat in is when I'm in 
this kind of this boredom or this lonely state right. where I have nothing to do or I have no purpose. Yeah. And I get into this state of like, well, I'm just going to grab a snack and start eating things. And I just become this like dumpster fire. And then I end up eating all of Lucas's food. I know. And I get very <laughs> mad at you about that. Yeah. But what's so interesting is now that I'm aware of this, I ask always in-depth questions to my clients about their hunger and if they tend to undereat or overeat when they're anxious mm -hmm. everybody wants to be the opposite of what they how they respond which is so interesting so mm -hmm. the people who are listening who are probably jealous that you under eat but at the same time it's just as detrimental so i just yes. want to remind people it's there isn't one better way to respond it's just being aware of which way you usually respond so don't get jealous of your partner who might react in opposition who might not be able to eat when they're anxious either way like you said i've seen you under eat and get injured because of it so um, and then go into patterns of overeating after having done it so mm -hmm. um so kind of speaking along those same lines because you mentioned tools what right. are some of the top tools then that can help people manage these triggers so there are three okay so one we kind of discussed the first two right mm -hmm. there's going to be some exercise tools that can reduce these yep. four massive triggers there's also going to be some nutrition tools and we can we can kind of go over some of those nutrition tools mm -hmm. to reduce those four triggers yeah Right. So or to avoid those triggers, like instead mm -hmm. of I mean, the, I always tell people it's like instead of having the gun on the table, what if you have the gun 10 miles away? Yeah, it would be so difficult to create some of these decisions. Mm -hmm. So you have your physical tools, you have your nutritional tools, and then you have your mindset tools. Yeah, which is ideally, guys, what I want to spend a majority of my time. We might have I apologize. We can't go over every <laughs> single tool that we use to ensure that our clients are optimized and healthy and losing weight. But we want to try to give you at least four. Maybe if we're if you're behaving, we can probably get <laughs> five. And when I say you're behaving, my son behaving, yeah. and we can give an extra tool. So those are the three big ones. Physical tools, physical mm -hmm. exercise tools, nutritional tip tools, yep. and then you have your mindset tools. Yeah. So let's give some tools. Let's give yeah. some value. You want to start with exercise? The, some exercise tools? Yeah. Yeah. So so can we start with just the H first? Yeah. You, maybe let's do you H. give maybe you give a nutrition tip on how to reduce hunger and then I can give a physical slash mindset. That'll be fun. Yeah. Let's do it. So hung, hunger. How do I reduce my trigger of massive levels of hungerness? So one thing that's super interesting when I first start meeting with clients is the compositions of their meals is what I'm looking at. Because we can, if we look at the three macronutrients, we've got carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Mm -hmm. Carbohydrates are the least satisfying mm -hmm. out of all three. So if I see someone and they're having cereal in the morning. Nothing inherently wrong with cereal, but that's just carbohydrates. There's no protein in there. There's no fat. And so without those two, they are going to be physically hunger, hungry sooner. Mm -hmm. And so what I teach when I teach the plate method, which we went over in our last episode, as well as balanced meals, mm -hmm. that can really help with hunger. If you are... Having carbohydrates, we say that they are naked when they're by themselves. So just avoiding naked carbohydrates by pairing them with a protein mm -hmm. or a fat is one way to help with hunger. Okay. So example would be <clears throat> if you're going to have fruit. So if you're going to have an apple, instead of having it by itself, have it with peanut butter. And it's a great combination anyway. So a lot yeah. of the combinations are good together. So most people are fine to be adding in and are excited. Mm -hmm. They get to have some fruit with Greek yogurt. Mm -hmm. Great. You can add that no problem. And now all of a sudden you're going to mm -hmm. feel less hungry in between meals. So 
That way, when you show up, let's say you have an afternoon snack that's balanced, you're going to come into dinner not being a 10 out of 10 on the hunger scale and just going to town on that meal. You're going to come in on maybe a seven Mm -hmm. and you're actually going to be able to slow down and taste that meal. So that's one of my largest ones is working on the composition. composition. Listen, if you're trying to lose weight, but you're just frustrated because you just can't seem to see any results, we would love to help you out. Now, we've been helping thousands of our athletes over the course of a decade by crafting personalized programs that are not only sustainable, but also effective. Now, if you're ready to transform your health, click on the show notes below, book a call with one of our coaches. We'd love to help you out. Now back to the show. Peace. (laughs) All right, so let's go. I want to go into a mindset tool. Because there, Wait, did you do physical? Kind of the physical and the mindset kind of go hand in hand, but not well, not well, for, yeah. for hunger. So for for the hunger, the mindset side. If you guys want to know how to reduce this craving mm-hmm. of feeling hunger, what I do with my clients is when they have that Oreo, when they have that extra pizza or that extra beer, mm-hmm. I ask them these three questions. So the first question is. Where was this at? Like what location was it? Yeah. Was it in the couch? Was it in your car? Was it at night? Was it in the morning? And they just write it down. You know, so I think that alone is very powerful. The location can be a trigger for them. Mm-hmm. Right? The couch can be a trigger. For me, the couch is a trigger. That's why we picked a level two star comfort on the couch <laughs> instead oh of gosh. a five star because I end up eating chips and salsa. I'll order things because I'm just, I'm just sloped in there. Mm-hmm. Right. So where's the location that's important? What time out of the day? The second one is what emotion do I feel before eating that? Not after, because after a lot of times people feel guilty. Right. Right. Or they feel happy, whatever that is. I want to know the emotion before. And what I've noticed over the course of the 10 years of training that it rarely is hunger. Right. Right. It's very, very rare that it's hunger because they're already extreme. A lot of them are extremely overweight or not extremely overweight, but 10, 20, 30, 40, 30 pounds overweight. Mm-hmm. And what they find is like, oh, it's always at the end of the night. It's always after my boss sends me this deadline the very last minute. It's always after I read all my emails. Right. So they start to understand that maybe hunger is not the trigger that it's something separate. It's one of the more emotional ones. Now, if it is hunger, that's okay. That body probably needs it. (laughs) Right, then listen to your Right, then listen to it. So just make sure the composition is right and you need to feed. You're like, Royce, why am I so hungry? Yeah, we've been lifting a lot of weight. That makes sense. So I go through that triage. Where's where's the location? What time is this at? And what's the emotion that you feel? Mm -hmm. So if the other, if, if, if all of them are good, then I'm like, okay, yeah, then we need to, yeah, you need to eat. Yeah. Your body needs to eat. But oftentimes that's not the scenario. Mm-hmm. Well, oftentimes the scenario is something really different. Every time I'm stressed out, right? Every time right. I have to clean the house mm-hmm. and, I, and whatever that is, it's just so eye-opening in terms of, in terms of just the mindset that they just start, them just noticing it they naturally start creating these like their own little tools to reduce some of that. Yeah. So, so if it is cleaning, they're like, I'm just going to hire a cleaner. And they have a cleaner come in and she's like, I'm never stressed. Mm-hmm. I'm never eating. I'm never drinking this glass of wine. So sometimes it's just that, yeah. which is so cool. So that's a mindset that. one. Yeah. And I would say for another thing that I do, which I'm probably going to implement a little bit more of those questions that you've been doing. That's why I love. Yeah. When we talk about stuff, then I end up stealing the things that you're doing. And yeah. I think sometimes you use my oh, stuff. Oh, I do. The one that you told me <laughs> about the hyperthyroid, I'm taking for sure. Yeah. We did have a good talk about that today. Um, we'll park that. So <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. So what I was thinking of for hunger was when I have people track their intake for me, there is a, a question as well that follows the intake that says on a scale of one to 10, how hungry were you before the meal? Mm-hmm. So sometimes quantifying it too. Mm-hmm. So not only saying, 
what was the emotion, but then saying, how hungry were you? It can be really powerful because they might realize I was like a two, like I wasn't even hungry at all. And then from there, that deeper layer that I am starting to get to with people is the emotion that's then associated with that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you were asking the physical side. Mm -hmm. So this is like, it's almost like inception, but the first initial question was hunger. Mm -hmm. And if in the, in the event that the location was somewhere and they had a particular emotion, the physical side, typically when you start to exercise, you're doing high intensity workouts, you're, you're Mm -hmm. hitting the bag, or maybe you're doing yoga could it, or you could be going for a walk. Yeah. Typically just the physical side of nature reduces a lot of their anxiety and these other separate emotions, because if we're not moving, all of these emotions are being stored. Right. And if you guys don't believe me, if you if you just ask yourself, where do you feel when you're anxious? I can possibly guess where a couple of those areas where you would feel that in your body, mm-hmm. right? Your neck, your chest, your eyebrows, yeah, your heart, just, yeah. your stomach, right? Yeah. Those are some key areas when people are anxious that that's where they store it. Mm-hmm. But when you start to exercise and you're breathing differently and you're moving your your body differently, there's this release that happens. Now, I don't know all the science behind it, but I'm going to tell you, most of my clients, when they start exercising more frequently, mm-hmm. they're less anxious. They're less depressed. Yeah. So just through movement alone will reduce that trigger of hungerness mm-hmm. and will really start to kind of show where the real triggers are. And that's really where I want to start getting into. Yeah. So, so now we've kind of done some physical stuff for hunger, and I want to go now into anxiousness. This is a good one. <laughs> so, so because which is a lot, which yeah. is for me, you're probably going to give me some coaching on this. But anxiousness, it could be anger as well for some people. Mm-hmm. What are some nutritional tools you use to reduce anxiousness? So most of the time what people are anxious around in relation to food is where – Are they going to get their next meal? What is it going to consist of? There's a lot of anxiousness with making the right choice. And so helping somebody plan out, like you said, what are you going to eat in the next three days? So I help to forecast what is the next week going to look like? What is our game plan? Because as soon as someone knows this is the day that I'm going to go get my groceries, this is the grocery list that I'm going to go off of for purchasing, here's the meals that I'm going to make the anxiousness around food choices just goes way down. We Mm -hmm. get um, way more anxious with food when we have no plan. So that's my biggest tip is actually creating some sort of plan and checking in with yourself. So I like to do night before planning is a principle that I teach with people where you might on a Sunday come up with that list of what you're going to be doing, but always spend some time the night before, ideally after dinner. Mm -hmm. You still have a little bit of time in case you need to do a target run, target pickup. Yeah. Any moms out there who do that last minute like I do. It's way easier now compared (laughs) to what it was. Yeah. And there's always an opportunity usually that night before to say, okay, I just got a phone call. Work said I'm actually going to be in person or I'm actually going to be at a meeting, which is supposed to be during my usual lunchtime. You can now adjust the plan. Mm -hmm. So when people don't take that time and don't consider changes, then the whole rest of their day, they're anxious. They're probably overly hungry because maybe they missed a meal. So just that planning the night before can really help with that anxiousness piece. I love that. I think planning and preparation are massive antidotes for anxiousness. Yes. And one of, as you were kind of explaining that, I started replaying a scenario that a lot of my clients have, especially when we go into in the next three weeks, and then the nutrition may be a little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. But in our checkpoint, I'm like, okay, Tara, we're going to do X, Y, and Z for your nutrition the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do that. However, I want to know what's going to happen in the next three weeks. Do you have a birthday coming up? Yes. Do you have a cruise? Are you going to Cabo? Like, is it your mm-hmm. best friend's 50th birthday, 40th birthday? Yeah. And they're like, actually, yeah, there is. It's my birthday in two weeks. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, perfect. So what are we going to do at that date? 
And what, what's very cool is oftentimes they don't even plan. Mm -hmm. And that planning, so when they get to that date, they have this like internal demon battle between yeah. them and themselves. And they also have a battle with me. They're like, oh, I'm going to let Royce down. I was like, no, no, right. no. When they don't plan. When they don't plan. Saying. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, let's just make a decision now. Are mm -hmm. you going to have that birthday wine? Are you going to have right. that birthday meal? Yes. Yes or no? And then they're like, I really want to. Let's just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just make that decision now. And I'm okay with it. Yeah. And then the second component to that is like, what are we going to do to earn that reward? And then they're like, okay. It, it changes their emotion behind it. They're no longer anxious. And mm -hmm. they're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get an extra workout. Yes. You know, I'm going to be 100% really good in our protocol for the next 14 days until my birthday. Mm -hmm. So they make the decision way ahead of time. So when they get into that scenario, they're not anxious. Yeah. And here's what's really cool oftentimes. They get to that scenario and they don't even overeat. They're just right. like, Royce, I, it sounds crazy, but... I didn't even have a cheat meal. Yeah. I felt so good that I didn't have a cheat meal. All I had was a taste of the cheesecake, but then I was like, I didn't really want it. Yeah. And I love planning for birthdays, parties, anything with my clients that's coming up that's going to be different than their usual routine. Mm -hmm. And it takes away the anxiety to just say, well, what's the most important thing for you? And mm -hmm. for a lot of my clients, they just actually don't like how they feel physically when they've overeaten, mm -hmm. when they've had something that's like very high in sugar, um, when they've had something, a lot of my patients who are lactose intolerant on a birthday or at someone else's house, they just will still engage in having those foods and they'll feel terrible afterwards. You've done that in the past mm -hmm. where like, you know, that something's going to hurt your stomach and when you pre-plan, do you actually like to feel that way? No one does. No one does, yeah. So when you're able to pre-plan and just say, well, how do you want to feel? They want to feel empowered. I actually did a reel about after Easter. I had people who had never had an Easter before in their life where they felt like they were in control with food. And it was because we pre-planned it. Two weeks before, we were talking about what's your Easter plan? What's your goal? How would you like to feel on that day? Most mm -hmm. people want to feel like they have enough energy to engage in activity with their family and not be in the bathroom or so uncomfortable they're just laying on the couch. Yeah. So as soon as they realize that's the goal, they're like, okay, sure. And I already know how to do that. So yes. that's what we've been working on. So uh, Yeah. And I think some of the main reasons why a lot of six-week or 12-week challenges mm -hmm. don't work is because they don't include life in the process. They're a hundred percent perfect for six weeks. Yeah. And to be completely honest, in a year, I would be questioning who you are if you had zero problems or zero events right. in those 12, 12 months. Yeah. So I always advise them to include those. Mm -hmm. Like we should have it. Let's just see. Let's right. just experiment. And yeah. what's really empowering, so if they if they don't do that trigger and they don't overeat, cool. Mm -hmm. But even if they did overeat, I'm like, let's track it. Yeah. And then let's just see it. And then the second week they're like, I still lost weight. Yeah. I was like, amazing. You can have a life and not be perfect in your nutrition and still make progress. How empowering is that? Yeah, because there is no perfect unless you're not willing to learn from mm -hmm. what's happening. Exactly. I think we both get so excited when people have upcoming challenges or things that might be potential challenges. We're like, yes. Yeah. So I have a client who's about to go on a cruise and I'm like, yes, I'm so excited yeah. because she's going to find out a lot and triggers are going to come up. And because we've already discussed what those are, what those look like, it's the opportunity to then have that in her pocket to build that confidence to say, I can go on a cruise. I can feel great. I can be active. I can eat the way that I planned. Mm -hmm. And she is on a weight loss journey. And I have all the confidence in the world she's going to be able to maintain that. And she's mm -hmm. so excited to have that. And it's it's cool to see. And like you said, when people maybe the, it goes sideways and they don't do what they planned – that's okay too. Mm -hmm. When people overeat, I always tell them, 
you know, we're trying to figure out what a 80% full is. That's when I advise people to stop is 80% full. How would you know what 80% is if you've never gone over it? Exactly. So it's just part of the learning. You're going to have to do that. But the mindset of I am learning from this instead of I have failed. There is Mm -hmm. no I'm off or on with nutrition when you're doing it like we do, which is sustainable because there's just room for growth everywhere. Exactly. And here's what's crazy. I think I'm more excited when they have a one pound loss in a week and Mm -hmm. then had an event like that instead of one that's like, I lost 10 pounds. I was like, that's cool because you were perfect. Right. But then when I when they lose a pound or two pounds and they've had an event where they had that glass of wine or that pizza, mm-hmm. I'm more excited for them because I know outside of me, that's what your life would look like. Right. And that's that's what matters. And then I highlight that. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is the best week that you've done so far. And here's X, Y, the reasons why. Yeah. This is what it would look like in real life. Mm-hmm but you did four workouts this week. You did your 10,000 steps out of the 27 meals that you ate or Mm -hmm. what is that? Three times seven, 27. Yeah. We're close, (laughs) right? One of those, like two two or three of those meals were were bad and you still made a pound loss. How amazing is that? Right. It's just very grounding. It's very empowering. And then all of a sudden they, they start to heal. And then the foods that, often would come up, they no longer feel guilty because they know they have that three meal threshold Yeah, that still allows them to make progress, Mm -hmm. which is very cool. Yeah. Okay. So I want to go over the mindset side of this, a mindset tool for reducing this trigger of anxiousness. Mm -hmm. And it's one that we've taught all of our trainers, majority of them, maybe some of the new ones I haven't done yet. But that particular tool is called writing your own eulogy. Mm-hmm. And I want to discuss why this is so powerful. Hey, Luki, can you grab me the uh, my phone? <laughs> See, this is why it's important to have your kid <laughs> as your... Uh... Thanks, buddy. Good job, buddy. Okay. But I wanted, I, I wanted to kind of share my eulogy so oh, people okay. get an idea. Let's do it. Maybe my wife. <laughs> I didn't know that we were going to be doing it. But, but then, no, it, it'll give them at least yeah. an idea of I'll... what, why it's so powerful. And I'm going to cry. So we'll yeah. just put that on there. I always yeah. cry when she I She always this. does, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. okay. It's important. So really quick, the premise of the eulogy is not you writing your eulogy. It's what another person would be saying about you. Mm-hmm. And there are three powerful ways you can do it. You can do all three. I recommend writing all three from a perspective of your partner, Yep. right? A perspective of your kiddo, if you have a kiddo, and then another perspective of your parent, Yeah. right? Sometimes we don't have the choice. Sometimes you go before your parents go, vice or vice versa. Right. And I think it's so powerful when you write these. So write it in a perspective of what they're saying and try to be as descriptive as you can. What's the clothes that they're wearing? Is everybody wearing white? Is everybody wearing dark? Like you can even write some of those scenarios as well. Mm-hmm. So, so what I wrote down was the most powerful one was my son's eulogy. Yeah, I wanted to, to get it from his perspective. So... I'm going to read this out, and uh, if my, my, my wife cries, then we'll cut into a segment. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, so this is coming from Lucas. Yeah. Okay, so my father was a great man. I remember he would always tell me that greatness meant three things. When people spoke your name, these three things would happen in this order. Number one, they would smile because in your presence, they felt love regardless of who you were. Number two, they would smile not because you didn't take work and your life seriously, but because it made things fun when things got really uncomfortable. Because you knew beyond the uncomfortable, the discomfort, the adversities, a greater version of you exists. 
Number three, they would cry because there was a moment in your life where he helped when no one else could. At those times, he didn't even know he was helping because it was just the small things that he did on a daily basis. It was his highs, it was his buys, it was his smiles that lifted people up from a dark place. My dad was serious when it came to work and he was relentless in becoming the best version of himself. He knew when he focused on that, he was able to show up a better husband, a better friend, a better leader, and a better father. I didn't see him all the time. However, when he was present, it felt as if I was the only thing that mattered. He was in every room he was in. He was present, he listened, and he taught. He knew one day he would pass, and he wanted me to pass on these three phrases before he passed away. To those maybe he has impacted and those he has not yet helped. Number one, there is abundance in every circumstance, good or bad. Number two, discomfort is a signal that you're going the right way. Number three, embrace death because when you do, it gives you more life. People are stronger because of him. People are happier because of him. People are healthier because of him. More importantly, I am better because of him. You may be gone physically, but spiritually you live on. Your thoughts, your values, your work, and your love is with me always. I love you, Dad. Thank you, and I'm going to miss you. <sighs> Sorry, Sugar. It's okay. Yeah. I sprung that out on you. Huh? <laughs> I know. I didn't know we were doing that today. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But I, I wanted to highlight, and I read this every time I'm anxious, and I'm anxious <laughs> nine days out of those seven days of the week. <laughs> yes, you are. And um, what's very cool when you start to write out some of these eulogies is some of the problems you think are problems are not even in there. The bills I got to pay, the coach that I have to have a hard, hard conversation with, the person that cut me off at the light. Yeah. None of those things were on that eulogy. So the things that weigh on my mind typically become weightless. And I start to focus on what is the most important to me. It's time with you. It's yeah. time with my son. It's yeah. including him to everything that I have. Mm -hmm. Right? And it just drops the pressure off. And when that happens, I'm able to make some really 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 good choices and for me, it just grounds me. And then I'm like, okay, why am I even freaking out? There's my son back there. <laughs> I think he's right? trying to come give me a kiss. So. Come give me a kiss. But. Thank you. I mean, what are your thoughts of why this is such a powerful tool? It's one of the hardest tools. I, I don't normally give it to my coaches the first time I meet them. It takes <laughs> right. me like a few weeks. I'm like, okay, I think he's ready. He's get ready. To know someone a little. Yeah, you can't spring this like your first session. You got to spring this in probably the seventh hour you meet them, you know, just to build that trust and, and just knowing who you are. Yeah. Why do you think it's so powerful? Well, when I did this, I remember thinking that there was some disconnect between what I was currently living and what I currently wanted to be remembered by. Mm -hmm. And there was just a lot of work that I had been placing on myself and expectation that didn't need to be there. So... It's like you said, it's a tool to decrease the anxiousness when you realize what are the most important things. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people that I'm working with who are trying to lose weight, they're trying to be healthy, it usually has a lot to do with their family or what they're trying to get out of life. Because mm -hmm. some of the biggest wins when I start to see people losing weight is that they're more active with their family. They go on hikes together. Those are the important things or some of their biggest fears. Yeah. They want to be around for their family. And if there's anything that they can be doing to ensure that, mm -hmm. there's a lot that's out of our control. Mm -hmm. But the things that are in your control, if you can be working on those to ensure that your family knew that you were taking your health seriously because you wanted to be there for them. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Another thing that I've noticed, especially the ones that slightly has a little bit more weight, 
is they have a lot more weight in their mind. Right. You know, it's things that a lot of times it's things they can't even control. Mm -hmm. So we list and then we deprioritize that over time. It's like, what can you control? What what can you not control? Which is another tool, by the way. Yeah. But oftentimes the one that tends to be more light in general, they start the ones that are successful in terms of losing the weight. Like, be careful, okay? Don't touch that, right? Is um, <laughs> are the ones that typically are like they're carefree, you know? They've somehow learned to manage what's what's the most important, right? And what is not important. And when they really start to understand that internally they start to release things that are typically that don't even really matter yeah and I was gonna say for me and this is true of 99% of women that I work with they're really good at caring for other people and not themselves Mm -hmm. and when you write the eulogy and I'm I am like tearing up thinking about it Mm -hmm. it all of a sudden helps you to create better boundaries. It's the number one thing that can help with anxiousness as well is if you have bad boundaries in life because you're just saying yes to everyone else, you're not realizing you're saying no to you. Exactly. So all of a sudden, if you're realizing this is really important to me, you're able to distinguish and say, I need to do this for myself. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm the most important. You told me that so many times where you're saying. Don't worry about me. Right. You're saying, don't worry about me. Don't worry about Lucas. And I'm like, how can I not? Mm-hmm. But I, it took me forever to realize if I'm taking care of me first and I'm the most important, then I'm showing up better for you and for Lucas. So it is my top priority. Yes. And that started to alleviate any anxiousness that I would have around, oh, am I being a good wife? Am I being a good mom? I know I am when I'm true to myself. Right. But that's all mindset. That, you know, yeah. that's the stuff that you've been helping me see over the last few years with what you've been teaching with a lot of these principles. Yeah. I remember that first time I did the eulogy. I was like, okay, yeah. I'm going to take some immediate action. Mm -hmm. to make this in alignment with what I would want someone to say about me. Yeah. It's one of my favorite practices because I know like their first draft, you can't even read it because there's so many tears going onto that paper. And I'm like, it's okay. We'll retype it. (laughs) We'll do it. (laughs) But I'm so used to it because it's such a, it was a powerful tool for me. Yeah. You know, and I related it to other things, it wasn't just like, I didn't have a weight loss problem, you know, it was, it was for other things. I was like, why am I not using this particular life coach tool into my practice? Right. And it, it just, it, that, that was just so impactful for me. I'm no longer, I feel weightless when I, when I read it. And that's the idea. Use this tool if you want to feel weightless. Mm-hmm. So it's it's so good and there's so there's so many more and we'll probably have to hash out some of those other other tools but that was one of the more impactful ones if you guys just do that for yourself oh my gosh i don't know what would happen to your weight it'd be amazing okay so let's go into the loneliness side Mm -hmm. so the loneliness i also consider it to be depression some people can call it boredom as well right but those are the loneliness side is very triggering for a lot of my weight loss clients, both male and female. Yeah. So let's go, let's, let's, let's create maybe a nutrition tip for that. Yeah. And then we'll create a mindset tip for that, Mm -hmm. possibly a physical one too. So. Yeah. For loneliness, I think that there's a lot of power in eating with others. So what I teach is mindful eating and how to have a mindful meal. And what's fascinating is people can be much more mindful when they're with others because it's a little bit more natural to have conversation, to breathe while you're eating, to maybe set down a utensil. And when you're by yourself, Mm -hmm. I find that my patients are saying they, number one, will be distracted by something like phone. They are not tasting their foods and they're eating very fast. And when we eat very fast, you are much more likely to then overeat the stomach doesn't have enough time to signal to the brain that you're full. And so you're most likely going to go over that 80% 
So a tool that I'll usually tell people is who can you have a mindful meal with? If someone tends to isolate and when they have even a few times a week a meal with someone else, they're realizing they're able to slow down to pace. And especially if they can have fun with it, like I'll say, do, you know, introduce mindful eating to your friend and see what you guys can be like really chewing your foods and tasting your foods and getting into the food experience. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now satisfaction goes up with that meal as well as being able to control and be confident that you're stopping at a comfortable full. So that's my biggest tip is eating with others. Mm -hmm. So good. So on the physical end, Mm -hmm. this is what I do. And I think people think it's kind of weird, but I do it on purpose. And I try to connect others. Yeah. I was like, hey, this is Tara. She's all, she's a she's a dietitian and this is Sam and he's an engineer. Mm-hmm. You know, or I or I pair two engineers up and I just introduce them. Yeah. And just that level of connection creates conversation. And some of the best healing parts is not the amount of reps I'm prescribing in class. Mm-hmm. It's the transitions where they're conversating. Right. It's the transitions when they're like, Oh my gosh, yeah, I had this event and it It was so hard for me, you know, and them just sharing some of those transitions and especially if they feel the same way, they don't feel it lonely. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people feel lonely because they feel that they're only one that is experiencing that particular moment in their life. Yeah. You know, we've been trainers for so long and then we've had clients that are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And as they get higher to their ages, they experience something called death. Mm -hmm. And one of my practices that I do is I try to, I I try to like get them to talk, you know, I was like, Hey, this is, this is Jan. And you know, if you ever want to talk about that, like she, she just experienced something like that. I don't do it all the time, but when they're ready, it's very powerful because loss can feel like you're the only one losing things. And it's nice to know that someone, someone has experienced something like that and Mm -hmm. they can have a a, a conversation with it. Cause I can't, Yeah. I haven't lost my parents, but I know so many clients that has. Right. You know, and I just like, hey, this is X, this is X, Y, and Z. I don't tell them. Mm -hmm. They just have a conversation. They almost internally feel it. Yeah. They're like, what's going on with you? And then they're like, oh, I just lost my mom. And then they have this connection. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, well, I lost my mom too. How are you holding up? Yeah. It's really hard. And then that is like some of the most coolest things that I see. And I'm on the back just watching this. And I'm just so grateful that -hmm. they're both there. So it's so important to have a community is is one thing. But in your workouts, don't just look at the whiteboard. Right. Look at the other people looking at the whiteboard because they have their own goals. They have their own demons. They have their own losses. Mm-hmm. And when you're able to connect, and you might be the helper in that case, right. you might not be the one that's being helped. And when you're offering, especially if you're offering an experience that you guys both, it's so healing for both. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I experienced that too. Now I get to, now I have an opportunity to actually help. Yeah, it is, it, and that's like that's that's how you can that's how you keep healing. Yeah. So. And imagine if you're going through a weight loss journey and there's somebody else who keeps showing up to class at the same time as you and you're able to share Mm -hmm. about your week, what's working for you, how to keep motivated. I love seeing our athletes motivate each other and Mm -hmm. it's just building that community for yourself Mm -hmm. and it's it's not hard to do. It just takes a little intention to know, okay, I'm, I'm not doing well. And it's because I'm in isolation Mm -hmm. and I'm in a state of depression. I need to start to put myself out there, find other people who are like-minded, who are trying to do the same things as me. Mm -hmm. And with that, I will thrive. I will say, Today, this morning, I have my hiking group that I created and Mm -hmm. selfishly so that I would always have people to go hiking with. And this morning was one of those days where I was, I would have been happy to just lay in bed and read my fantasy book that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. And I knew this is why 
I created the hiking club because I knew that my friends knew that I was going to be there. And there was no way that I was going to not be there because I had told them that I was going to. Right. And so I'm like, this is exactly why um, it's so important to have something like that where you're saying, I'm going to be doing something healthy with others. You're going to double, triple, quadruple the chances that you're actually going to engage in that activity when there is community. Yeah. And here's what's also cool. I just, I was thinking that, that community side of it. At some stage in weight loss, especially for females, the weight stops to move or just start, it just stops moving. You know, they lose 20, 30 pounds and then they hit this plateau and they have this internal battle. Yeah. And for me, I can't have that conversation because I'm a dude. I'd like to know that I know it because I've trained a lot of females, but it doesn't have the same power. Yeah. What's exciting <laughs> is when another female goes on who's like, girl, congratulations. And let me show you my photo. And then she shows the photo of her losing, it looks like she lost a lot of weight. Right. And then the, 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 the eye-opening component for them is like, no, but I didn't lose any weight here. Yeah. This is what's going to happen to you. So it normalizes almost what the experience is going to be like for someone, which is so cool. So having that community is nice because you might be hitting a plateau, but then there's someone that has experienced that same plateau and what that mindset is like, and it just normalizes the struggle and it's okay yeah and it's actually part of the process and then they and then you can borrow a narrative from them yeah then and then you just you just keep going yeah i love that which is so cool okay so i want to give a mindset tool and a mindset tool is just we've we've done something like this it's called the warrior wizard healer Mm -hmm. and i'm one of those people that i can feel lonely in a room full of a hundred people or a room full of coaches and I can still feel lonely. And this particular mindset tool is not only being aware of who you are in this particular avatar, but also how others are in their own world. Mm -hmm. So we did a practice, it was called Warrior Wizard Healer. And for the most part, innately, you're one of these three, right? So just, I don't wanna go over like the whole details on this, but you're a warrior if you take massive action. Yeah. You're a task person. You're a massive to-do list. And a lot of times you're typically like you're, you're, you just go. Mm-hmm. You're just always on the go. Like give me the problem. I'm going to solve it. That's typically a warrior. Yeah. The, the, the wizard is typically someone that is just very knowledge-based. They want to mm-hmm. be certain about everything. Right? They're going to be reading all of the research articles. Reading, yeah, they're reading all the research articles. They're reading as many books as possible. Mm-hmm. They're typically skeptic when they see some type of marketing platform, so they're going to go research who this is just to make sure it's legit. Yep. Right? Those are they're extreme researchers. They, ha- they, they need extreme certainty to take action. Mm-hmm. Right? And then you have somebody that's a healer that just loves to take care of people. Yeah. That's what they love to do. Right, so they see someone hurt, they want to fix it. Mm-hmm. They see someone crying, they want to make sure they're they're supported. Yeah. So like those are the healers, and each of these avatars, there's massive strengths. Right, the healer heals, the warrior has wars, and they the conquer problems, and then the the wizard can be extremely potent and powerful because they know everything, mm-hmm. right? And they can do a lot of damage. Now they all have their inherent weaknesses as well. So the the, the, the wizard can essentially do so much and or keep learning that they never take action. Yeah, right. very and then, slow. Very slow. The warrior takes too much action and they're just- Without thought. <laughs> without thought and they create wars that, and they just hurt unnecessary people in the process. Mm-hmm. And then the healer can f- essentially be so docile that they do nothing or they heal everyone and they forget to heal themselves. right. Right. So like those are some of the things. And I think it's really cool to identify where you are because one, you'll know who you are. Yes. And and then you can start to categorize other people in your community. Not right. because not because you they're just that, but they just are that at the moment. Mm-hmm. I've always felt lonely when I would try to conversate with someone to solve a problem, but they're a healer. 
Mm-hmm. So what I mean is I'm like, hey, I, like, uh, this is the problem that I have. And then they're, what they're doing is giving me a hug. Right. And I'm like, I don't want a hug. <laughs> you know, I like, let's figure this out. They're like, oh, poor. Like my mom is like that. Yeah. Are you doing OK? You need a hug. You want to make you some food? And I started to realize, like, why am I having wizard conversations and warrior conversations to a person that just needs that is innately a healer? Right. That doesn't want me to have any problems. Mm-hmm. Right. That wants everything to be peaceful. Yeah. So like in moments when you don't understand who you're conversa- conversating with can feel very lonely because what you're trying to get out of the person is something that they can't give. Mm-hmm. So the moment I started to realize that there's different people that's around me that are different avatars, I started to feel more wholesome. Because now I'm like, hey, dude, I got this challenge coming up. I need help in this, this, and this. And right. if I say that to someone that is like a warrior, they're in. Yeah. They're like, when do we start? I want to do that challenge. So guys like Corey is like that for me. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or guys like, uh, well, Nick is typically a healer, but he, he does take action in certain ways. Like so you can be hybrids. Yeah, the percent of where you fall, I think, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then what you are to certain people Mm -hmm. in different settings. Because at work, you might have to have a little bit more of that warrior Mm -hmm. to accomplish your tasks. Maybe you're not in a job where you can just sit and read books. Yeah, And so you're a little bit uncomfortable, but you to take action and to perform well, you have to have that warrior spirit yeah and it's just it becomes it becomes like a conversation that typically becomes draining oftentimes can be very rewarding because now you know how to yeah. to engage with that person you know like for you like i'll have conversations with you i'm just like i i, I need a repair i'm tired mm-hmm. and then you'll have conversations with you, you need a rest yeah. or you'll or you'll say things that i typically say in my head we had that conversation where I had an eight-hour work day, and I <laughs> yeah. crushed it. And then it was a half day for me because I was done by, like, two. Yep. And then you were, like, you just had my narrative where it was, like, yeah, you're not doing you're not doing bleep. Like, get to work. Eight hours is for the week, you know. And, <laughs> and it was just, like, it was very nagging. But then I understood what you were trying to do. Like yeah, you, you started to... laughing immediately because I could tell in your head you were beating yourself up. And so instead I decided I'm going to say out loud what I think is happening in your head. Yeah, which is perfect. Which was spot on. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. it is a nice way I found to have conversations with people. So when I've done this activity with people, then in future I can say, hey, I know you're trying to be a healer right now. Yeah. And they're like, oh, you're right. Yeah. I am. Okay. So what do we need to be pulling from instead? And there, it's usually mm-hmm. I got to have a little bit more warrior to get done what I need to and stop taking care of others when it's a detriment to myself. Yes. Yeah. So it's a kinder way to say that to people. Mm-hmm. Are you being... Or if people, uh, certainly there's people too who I meet with who they want to know a lot of research. They're reading a lot about health and habits and so to the extent where they're not doing anything. And I'll be like, all right, little wizard, Mm -hmm. (laughs) we got to start taking some action that's applicable to you. Mm -hmm. I know you've read a lot, but how are we going to make this actionable? And so being able to say that to someone I think is the best way instead of any other way that I could say it. And so I found that I can really connect with people when I'm able to do that. And I love when you are able to say that to me or when some of our coaches are able to say that to me, like, come on. Yeah. Like you're being a wizard about this. (laughs) Exactly. And then when you know their deficits, you can, you can be of support uh, for that deficit. Yes. Right. So, and it's also just know, I think one of the coolest practices you can do is just identify your partner. Mm-hmm. and who they are. I think some of our earliest moments where we would have fights is because we were communicating entirely different. Right. You're thinking I'm a healer, but I'm really a problem solver. I'm a warrior and a wizard at heart. Mm-hmm. So in moments where you just wanted me to listen and hug, I never gave you that because I'm typically not a healer in that case. Right. 
I can be a healer, but typically my initial response is like, okay, this is the three things you need to do to get this done. He's like, I don't want you to solve anything. I just need a hug. <laughs> right. And I'm like, and then we have these conversations and then we have these battles. Right. But knowing who I am now, you typically don't have, you don't come into that. So if like, if you yeah. needed a healer in that case, you have friends that are healers. A hundred percent. So we, we tap into our strengths now instead of like tapping into something that we're so weak at, which requires me a lot of energy just to hug someone and not no. solve their problems. <laughs> yeah. And so I don't feel as lonely because I'm not coming to you as my partner thinking the expectation is that you're mm-hmm. going to want to do that. I'm like, he's going to want to solve this problem. I know it. Yeah. And I love you for that. But if I'm not ready to have it solved, then I typically won't go to you first. Now, when I'm ready, Mm -hmm. you're for sure the person that I'm going to come to. So when we teach this to people, I think that they're able to interact then with their partners and their family members differently. And Mm -hmm. they feel less lonely because they are strong in who they are. And they also appreciate everybody for their aspects of their personality. Right. It's so good. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into the last one because Lucas is gonna have a because Lucas is tired. Temper tantrum. <laughs> yeah, he's on the tired side. Okay, so let's let's give some tired tools to kind of wrap some of this up. Some of the mental ways to fix it. Some of the nutritional ways to fix it, and then we can give them some and, actions. And physical. Oh, and physical. Yeah. Okay. How about you start with the physical this time? Okay, so I think physical is pretty easy. As you start to exercise more. Ironically, you're spending all this energy, but in return, your battery becomes more. Mm -hmm. You become more energized physically. So in the pursuit of burning energy, you gain energy, Mm -hmm. which is really cool, right? So just physically moving more. It can even be something that's more passive like yoga. I mean, it's not completely passive, but it tends to be slower pace. You can can tend to be energized that way. Mm -hmm. So just moving more will get you more energy in general. A hundred percent. And for nutrition, I would say the biggest thing to help people with energy is one of the things that I see in the first few weeks when I work with someone, once we have gotten them into a routine Mm -hmm. where their eating pattern is consistent, they have more energy. So when we have balanced meals at predictable times throughout the day their body gets used to that their energy goes up right and so all of a sudden they have more energy to be able to perform tasks that they didn't used to before so that along with just moving a little bit i mean that's super powerful but i also think the mindset is the biggest for this one yeah for yeah so you explain what the tool is but i'm excited yeah. about this one because this is where i see people their minds are like blown. blown away yeah so first off when we when we talk about tiredness right the t component of halt it's both it's two parts one it's physical tiredness and the other is mental tiredness and oftentimes when i get a client they're not physically tired they're overweight mm-hmm. they're not doing much you know unfortunately But what they are tired is they're mentally tired. Extremely. Extremely. They're mentally drained. So the way we we really create a mindset framework around this is to first identify five to ten people they admire the most. And once they admire the five to ten people they admire the most, we also want them to write down as many traits that you admire about that person, Mm -hmm. whether it's knowledgeable leadership they're amazing communicators Mm -hmm. they are very caring they're very loving they're very authentic right whatever that attribute is we want them to write those things down and once we identify some of those things we also like for each individual person for that for the 10 that they admire we have them like add numbers to them yeah so they quantify it so let's just say there's out of the 10 people, in terms of the, the, the admiration trait that they have is leadership, mm-hmm. maybe seven of them hit that category. Right. And if you do this for every trait and you, you quantify them, you're going to find that five of them, maybe six of them, are going to be the top five. Yeah. 
And then those top five are going to be those macro traits. And those traits are actually your traits. Mm -hmm. They're traits that innately you have, whether it's DNA, but also it can be partly how you were raised and how you were nurtured. And those are going to be some of your critical traits. And each of these traits, so th so identify those is huge. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing we do is like, what are some, what are the five things that you do that when you do it, it energizes you? Yes. And then they list those five out, mm -hmm. right? Oh, it's me hanging out with my wife. It's me reading a book. It's me going to work out. It's me meditating. Mm -hmm. It's me t me doing charity work. Right. So, and what we find those five things that they do are typically helping feed some of those values and traits. Mm -hmm. So, an example is kindness. Every time they're doing charity work, they feel they feel like they're lighting up. Right. Or or one of their traits is knowledgeable. Every time they're reading a book or listening to a podcast and they're learning energized. something, they're energy energized. So those are just some key examples. Mm -hmm. This is where it gets really cool. The, uh, list out five things that drain your cup mm -hmm. or drain your energy. And then they start to list things in you know, a complaining or a person just not caring about someone right. or a person just scrolling or I or me scrolling on TikTok aimlessly mm -hmm. with no possible direction and just for the kindness component value that might be draining for them if they're if if they see someone like hurting someone yeah in conflict in conflict yeah hard conversations hard com yeah a dirty environment a dirty environment or another one can be mindlessly scrolling on TikTok and not learning anything. And one of their traits is knowledgeable. Yeah. So it's dopamine release, but afterwards they feel really drained from it. So just so it's just some of those things can be so awakening for a lot of clients that they're just like, okay, I just got to do more of those things. So I want to I want to ask how you're able to quantify because I think you took some of the concepts that I've taught yeah. and you've made it into like this beautiful wheel and you've quantified it. It's great. So I call it the wellness ratio and up at the top of the, you know, assignment that they're working through, it's their five cup fillers and then their five drainers and they have to pick the top ones. Mm -hmm. And they need to quantify how frequently it's happening. So if it happens once a week, they put a one next to it. If it's happening two times a week, they put a two. The max that you can put is seven, even if you're doing this multiple, multiple times. times per day. And then if it's happening less frequently than once a week, then you have to put a zero. Mm -hmm. And I always say, that's fine. Put a zero. We're recognizing that you know, learning is something that does give you energy, but you're not doing it frequently right now, mm -hmm. then you're going to add that up. So you're going to get a total for your cup fillers. You're going to do the same thing for drainers. And then you're going to see what that ratio looks like. And I love doing this with people because for mm -hmm. people who are very confused on why they're not able to see progress with any of their goals with weight loss with anything that they're working through they all of a sudden realize oh it's because i'm drained all the time i have five cup fillers and i have 30 cup drainers so what we also talk about is the timing of when those things happen are you waking up turning on your phone and immediately are on social media seeing news or having hard conversations with people, answering texts emails. that are stressful, looking at emails. And so when you front load your day with your cup fillers, we kind of go through how does that day look when you wake up, you meditate, you take time for yourself, you do 10 pages of reading in a book, you move your body. Mm -hmm. And then they're able to realize, oh, once I front load the day with the cup fillers, the cup drainers become easier. Right. And it's also just understanding we have things that are in our control that are in the cup drainers side, and then we have ones that are not. And so the ones that you have control over, let's start <laughs> taking those down. Let's start taking that frequency from seven out of seven. Let's start taking that down. So then that ratio is then adjusted. So where we're e increasing yeah. the fillers, we're decreasing the drainers. Mm -hmm. 
And the part that I added on to the wellness ratio was that I also have people list out five things that when they perform these habits, they feel like they're moving in the direction of health or recovery. Okay. And then they're going to quantify that as well. Now, this is going to be stuff that's kind of boring, but when they do it, they feel like they're moving in the direction of health. Sometimes that's meal prepping. I don't know anybody who's like, this This really energizes me. I love meal prepping. Maybe cooking, but actually scheduling and meal prepping and grocery shopping. Those are things that I find people will list on the, if I do these, then they lead me in the direction of health. And then the uh, the other part to that is I have them get that number. Then we look at what are five things that make you feel defeated in your health journey. So someone might say if they have been looking at the scale because that's been their indicator their whole life of their progress has been the scale, that might be number one. They're weighing themselves every day and they always feel defeated because they always look at that number and they feel defeated. So no matter if they're doing all of these good things, when they look at that scale, they feel like it takes them down. Mm -hmm. And so essentially we do the same thing where we look at that ratio and I've had people who realize this is why we've been working together for three weeks and I still feel defeated even though I have done everything that you've told me. I've started to really understand my hunger fullness cues. I'm meal prepping now, but they keep being defeated and their energy keeps being drained. So that wellness ratio, we just keep incrementally adjusting until they have more of the cup fillers and more habits that are leading them towards health. And everybody's different, which is why it's fun to do. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different answer and to expose what those habits are that are fillers and drainers. It's fascinating and they're revealing themselves and how they can heal themselves. So that's one of my favorites. It's good. It's just, I think it's one of the most impactful tools that we teach because it's just... It's so impactful. Yeah. Having them readjust their energy mentally and physically, they're able to make all of the decisions that we tell them with like effortless consciousness effort. Yeah. Because they just feel good. They're like, yeah, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And when when you're when you're drained all the time, the amount of willpower to not eat a cookie requires so much energy as opposed to when you just feel good. You're like, I don't need it. Yeah. Because we are looking for that quick dopamine release, a lot of these foods that create. But if we already have some of those emotions already, because we just had a day that was just perfectly planned for us, we don't have those triggers. Yep. So we just did a whole master class on this. We'll probably have to like break <laughs> some of those pieces down because our son's going to have a temper tantrum here soon. But let's wrap this up. Let's give them one or two action plans that they can do right now that can possibly help them lose the weight, possibly some controlling some of these triggers. Yeah. What's your, what's yours? Mine, mine is just to write what one list out the four Mm -hmm. and then I need them to circle the top one. Now it could be all four. Right. And people are like, it's all four of these. That's why I'm not losing weight. I want you to just pick one, Mm -hmm. circle it. And then pick one of the tools that we just gave you and just see if you can apply it and then measure it for the next three weeks. And I think that's just one big thing. Like tackle one of the letters at a time. Don't try to tackle all three. Yeah. Because sometimes if you just tackle one, it has like a ripple effect. It fixes the other ones. Yeah. Right. So focus on one, use one of those tools or multiple tools to just fix that one Mm -hmm. and then see where it goes. I love that. That's one of mine. I feel like that's the perfect one. But if I could add something to that, awareness is always that first step. And last time when we talked, we Mm -hmm. told people the actionable step they should be taking is just writing down what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I'll say write down what you're eating and start to write down as well with like the, for the hunger, start to write down your hunger and fullness. Start to write down when things are draining. When you see that full picture of what's happening in your week, because 80% of what we do is just out of habit, 
I want people to just come away with the awareness. So start writing things down so you can actually understand what's going to be the most potent tool to be using. But first is that awareness. So take a week and just see. When we do that cup filler, cup drainer, some people are so mind blown by it that they have to take a week to even see. They can't even figure out what those things are. And now is a great time to just start writing those things down and to try and quantify how frequently things are happening. So good. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So guys, do me a quick favor. If you find out in this episode which particular trigger is triggering you the most to create some of these unhealthy habits, write it down on the comments. It's going to give us an idea on, on a possible future episode on how we can really go on the practical side to really fix some of those things and give you the best tools that we are currently using so you guys can continue losing the weight. If you guys like this episode, make sure to share it. Make sure to subscribe. We'll have all the show notes if you want to work with us. I know my wife is, she doesn't even really have that much on, on your list, but we'll put the link on there. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> and um, I'll see you guys later. Peace out. Bye.